I decided to write this book soon after Roman Abramovich bought Chelsea Football Club in 2003. Uh, here is this guy who comes to London. He looks like a Ukrainian construction worker, dresses, you know, like a ordinary guy, very um, diff diffident personality, very low key. Suddenly he's a billionaire and he buys and he's spending like millions and millions on new players for Chelsea. He arrives in London. Nobody's heard of him. Nobody knows who he is. So the instinct of people like me as journalists and investigative authors is to try and find out where did the money come from? How did he make it so quickly? Where did it go? And so that's really how I started. And, then, you know, he owned property and he owned flats in, in Knightsbridge near Harvey Nichols and Harrods. And we researched the ownership of his flats. And it was curious that in the property records of the apartments that he owned, the actual properties where he was living in London were owned by like obscure Caribbean islands, you know, companies, offshore companies. So that we came then, every, I became very interested in investigating. And then it was clear that a lot of the Russian oligarchs and from Ukraine and other East European countries, they were using British lawyers, British accountants, London estate agents. So there were, I became very interested in, in a lawyer called Stephen Curtis, who was the lawyer for Berezovsky and Kordakovsky. And um, he became a kind of key figure in the London grad story because he was the lawyer, just an ordinary British guy, very intelligent, photographic memory, um, never used a computer in his life, um, but just a brilliant man and could set up and hide money. So I then met someone who used to work for him and he gave me a lot of documents and he became a central figure in the London grad story. And that's how really I was able to write the book. Well, Stephen Curtis, the lawyer for Berezovsky and Kordakovsky and others, uh, in 2004, he became very nervous about what he was doing because he was a British lawyer and he was basically money laundering for people and hiding money and involved in all kinds of activities for the oligarchs in London. And he knew that the authorities would catch up with him, so he secretly started cooperating with the British police and the intelligence service in the UK um, and he became a registered informant on Russian organized crime and oligarchs in London very secretly while at the same time he was working for them. It was, he thought he was the best way to protect himself and what happened was that six weeks after he became an informant he died in this helicopter crash because he what he did was that he had an office in Mayfair and then every day he would commute from Battersea, he had a helicopter in Battersea in South London and that would take him to his house which was a castle down in Dorset in the West Country and then one day soon after he became a informant for Scotland Yard the police, his helicopter exploded in mid-air and crashed and the pilot was killed and he was killed so there's no hard proof that he was murdered but you know the so, so, he, he certainly thought before he died, he had death threats, and he told his relatives before he died that he thought he would be murdered. Other people think he was murdered. There's no absolutely decisive proof, but you know there's a possibility. And so um, that was a pretty dramatic um, example of, of what happens when you get involved with oligarchs. So other lawyers have replaced him, but they keep very low key profile because of what happened to him. So lots of lawyers in London act for oligarchs in terms of managing their assets, uh, setting up companies to buy properties in London or private jets or yachts because they don't want to be seen to be doing it themselves because quite often they're being sued in courts or the Russia or the prosecutors in London, prosecutors in Russia are after them. So they don't want to buy a house in their own name or have assets in their own name because then um, that could be, those assets could be seized. So they have companies and they have people who do that for them. In my book, in London Grad, I concentrate on, on, on four Russian oligarchs. So Boris Berezovsky, Mikhail Kordakovsky, um, Oleg Deripaska, um, and Roman Abramovich. And they're all four different characters. They all made their money in the 1990s, but they did it in different ways. So Berezovsky made his money 
by playing the political game, manipulating and bribing Yeltsin to get state contracts and influence. Roman Abramovich was effectively a business partner to Berezovsky and Abramovich was, was, was more of a businessman in terms of negotiating contracts and he was a bit more conventional uh, and legitimate in that sense of understanding the oil industry. But he made his money through basically through the sell-off of very lucrative oil assets, no, notably the Seven Left Oil Company. Khodorkovsky, uh, again, was more of an intelligent businessman, but again, um, he made a lot of money uh, acquiring very valuable oil, oil fields, but again, for a, a, a tiny price. Um, and, uh, and then um, and Deripaska, was more um, involved in the aluminium business and he was much closer to, to, to the government. So they're all different characters, not just in their personalities, but the, 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 the common theme for all these oligarchs of the 1990s is that they acquired huge wealth very quickly for a low price and the, the consequences of that were, were very bad for the Russian economy and the Russian people. The famous story of Abramovich, which he denies, you know, is that, you know, he was in his, um, on his private jet in Baku in Azerbaijan, and he suddenly decided he wanted some sushi. So he was staying in the hotel in Baku, and he got his private jet to fly back to London to go to Nobu, which is the famous restaurant in London, and get his favorite sushi and fly it back. So those are the sort of things they would do, um, I think. We, but as a but, uh, but but Abramovich is sort of a low key kind of guy. So with with Berezovsky, um, he was obsessed by having as many bodyguards as possible. So he would have a car in front of him, with like three bodyguards. He'd be in the car behind, and there'd be another car behind him with another three bodyguards. So you're like six bodyguards, you know. And then he was obsessed by when he would go to a dinner party in London, he was absolutely obsessed by who was sitting at which table and what were they like and all the names. So he would try and change the the layout of the table of who was sitting where so he could sit to, sit next to the most important people, you know. And so I think in terms of weird behavior, Brezovsky was the most sort of extreme, you know. Uh, Deripaska, and Abramovich were kind of actually quite low-key guys, you know, except they were absolutely um, obsessed with, with security and, and all the rest of it. Very secretive, um, but not the sort of people who would go to nightclubs and behave outrageously, to be honest, um, but just uh, very closed-up people. I mean, Berezovsky is the most sort of exciting, interesting personality um, but the longer he was in London, the less seriously anyone took him because he was so transparently just interested in political power and he lost his influence towards the end of his life, which is why he committed suicide. Um, you, you believe that it was? I think he committed suicide. Some people think he was murdered. Some credible sources think he was murdered. I'm not sure. Um, I know that he was in financial serious trouble at the end of his life. He owed a lot of money. On the other hand, other people say that some assets were sold and he, he, had, he had money, but he could not access the money. So, but his wife was divorcing him at the time and also, I think he was a very emotional, instinctive human being. He would do things instinctively, quickly, without really thinking, because his mind worked very quickly. And I think it was almost like an emotional spasm when he committed to us. I'm pretty sure I've not really investigated it. Again, it's like Kurt, it's like a lot of murder stories. The, the, the most difficult stories to research and investigate are murder and sex. Because, you know, there's, there's no proof, you know, unless there's a video, how do you, you know, get the evidence? So it's a very difficult thing. When I was investigating the oligarchs, I think the sheer amount of money that they were able to accumulate was quite 
staggering, you know, billions and billions so quickly. And the fact that you had oil fields and aluminium plants and gas companies or whatever it was, um, which were worth several billion dollars. I mean, we're looking at probably eight or nine billion dollars, and this is 20 years ago, um, which they were able to acquire for maybe 50 million, you know, it's up. It was pretty, that shocked me in terms of how how they were able to, I mean, Abramovich, um, you know, became incredibly wealthy very quickly, you know, almost from nothing. And he was a, he was a good businessman. He was a, very, he was a brilliant negotiator, but still, you know, and he was able to pay 20 million here, 30 million there for a new player for Chelsea Football Club without really... I and mean, you know, so where did the money come from? You know, it's not as if he built a company from scratch, like an entrepreneur, and built it up, built it up, built it up, and sold it. You know, he acquired these assets by borrowing a relatively small amount of money from the banks, and then able to get these assets. So these really valuable oil fields. Um, so that kind of shocked me the scale of it, <clears throat> and I think also just the lifestyle. You know, but I mean, it's not the lifestyle is not that unusual in the sense of having private jets and yachts. But you know, you look at another Russian oligarch called Melnichenko, who has this yacht that's like two hundred million, you know, for one yacht. And it's you think about it and you then you read or see on TV the problems of Syria and all the refugees and all these people who who actually a lot of them are like intelligent. Or, you know educated people who are absolutely suffering you know I mean it's sort of obscene and they're in these refugee camps and it's it's like a hundred years ago and then at the same time you've got these oligarchs it's not just a Russian thing it's a global thing we have so much money and they don't need a yacht which is worth 200 million I mean it's just you know so I think the scale of it shocked me more than anything else very few of the oligarchs gave money back and the only one I think to be fair is Abramovich he has given some money to charities in terms of the provinces in in Russia where he is come comes from or he's a governor of he has actually given some money back and has given money to some charities Berezovsky absolutely no Kordakovsky will give money to charities or foundations but that's more political there are Pasca, I don't think he's given money to any charities. I'd be surprised if he has. Some of the oligarchs will give money to charities to buy like artifacts or art from overseas to bring them back to Russia. So like the Fabergé eggs, um, which I can't remember, I think they're in America. And so there was an oligarch called Victor Vexelberg and he spent a lot of money in buying art or national treasures which had left Russia to bring them back and you could argue that's a sort of charitable thing and he spent like 11 million to do that um, but in the reality is no I mean I think Abramovich is the exception well the big influence of the oligarchs in London is property and what's happened in the last 10 years is that a lot of the oligarchs have moved their money out of Russia to to buy property in central London at very high prices very expensive the best properties in London very expensive prices and the consequence of that is that it's had a knock-on effect on the London property market which means that pro prices have gone up and it's meant that for average British people uh, cannot afford to live in their own country or their own city and the properties that they buy in Mayfair and Belgravia and Knightsbridge, they don't even live there. Um, they're only in London for maybe two months a year at the most. So they're empty uh, and it's made a lot of parts of central London like ghost towns. You know, there's no real life there. Um, but there's also an issue of money laundering in terms of them, you know, basically using London as a way of laundering their money and hiding their money. But in terms of how it's affected the British life, I think, you know, certainly it's it's had a big negative impact on property prices. There's also an element of fear in terms of security 
because then when Litvinenko was murdered in 2006 and there's been a couple of other deaths in UK and London of Russian, you know, prominent Russian people here, there's been an element of fear, you know, in terms of tension. Um, and uh, so that's been the real impact. And the, I think the thing for the oligarchs in London is that they were desperate for acceptance, and to be accepted. Uh, so they would like to become like the English, you know, even try and dress like the English people, like, you know, because they love that old fashioned English gentleman, civilized, sophisticated approach, which is totally different from Moscow and Russia, obviously. You know, we're all they're totally different people and different, so they would even like, you know, try and dress like them. You know, they would just love to be part of the British establishment.